Let's continue. Dorotea's first reaction is to counsel Fernando regarding the contrast between social castes. I told him to mind well what he was doing and to consider his father's anger upon seeing him married to a peasant. But what is truly amazing about this passage is that Dorotea now tells us what was going on inside her mind. Her logic is subtle and reasonable from various points of view. First, she contemplated Fernando's desire as an opportunity to achieve, finally, the social status that her family had always sought. And I said to myself, indeed, I shall not be the first woman who, by way of marriage, has risen from a humble to a noble estate. I would do well to embrace the honor that fate now offers me. Second, she realized that this was the only option she had under the circumstances. And if I want to reject him with disdain, I can see that he is acting so extreme that not using the proper one, he will use that of force. And I will come to be dishonored without an excuse for the guilt that will be attributed to me by anyone who doesn't know how I've come to this point without it. For what reasons will be enough to persuade my parents and others that this nobleman, Caballero, entered my chamber without my consent? Notice that this amazingly complex thinking ends with yet another bivalent theogma around the term extreme, termino, which first serves as an adverb, meaning out of control, and then as an alighted noun, meaning exceptional act. Dorotea's intricate interiority makes that of Don Quixote, the reason of unreason which has overtaken my reason, seem rather pathetic. Like many authors, Cervantes recognizes that the inner thoughts of women are typically thousands of times more complicated than those of men. Essentially, Dorotea informs us that she thought through her situation as would a lawyer or a very good accountant. I reviewed all these questions and answers in an instant in my imagination. She even called her maid to have a witness in addition to those of heaven, and in theory the image of the Virgin Mary, although she does not mention it again. Then, to the tears and oaths of Don Fernando, the ceremony concludes with the most powerful theogma in the entire novel. And with this, and with the departure from the room of my maid, I ceased to be one, and he became a traitor and a liar. More ominous still, before dawn, Fernando escaped, although he left Dorotea a ring. The young woman's confusion is remarkable, and meanwhile, a minor mystery is clarified for us. I didn't have the strength, or else I forgot, to scold my maid for the betrayal she committed by letting Fernando into my chamber, because I had not yet determined whether what had happened to me was a good thing or a bad thing. Dorotea spent several months without seeing her new husband. She requested his presence, and she knew that he was in the village and that most days he was out hunting, a pastime of which he was very fond. Another hunter. Who does this remind us of? In the end, she receives news that Fernando had married a maiden named Lucinda in a nearby town. Cardenio now begins to sob, but Dorotea continues. Filled with anger and rage, she set out on foot to find Fernando. She took with her, in a canvas pillowcase, a woman's dress, and some jewelry and money in order to be prepared for anything. She was accompanied by a lad, Thagal, that is, one of her father's servants. What could this lad have been thinking? The description Dorotea gives of her escape recalls the famous poem by San Juan de la Cruz, Dark Night of the Soul. And in the silence of the night, without telling my treacherous maid, I left my house. She arrived at Lucinda's town in two and a half days, and someone told her the whole story of her failed marriage to Fernando. Dorotea even adds details that Cardenio either did not know or forgot. For example, we now know that in the letter hidden in her bodice, Lucinda had written that she could not be Fernando's wife because she was Cardenio's. Dorotea also reports that after reading the letter, Fernando had reacted furiously, lunging at Lucinda. And with the same dagger that they had found on her, he tried to stab her. And he would have if her parents and others who were present had not stopped him. Then she tells us 
that Cardenio had also left a letter in which he revealed the wrong that Lucinda had done him and that he was now going where nobody would see him again. With this news, Dorotea regained hope because, as she says, the door to my remedy was still not entirely closed. According to Américo Castro, the founder of the modern study of Cervantes, Dorotea's understanding of these events and what they should mean to Fernando is the purpose of the novel as a whole. It could be that heaven had placed that impediment to his second marriage as a means of making him realize what he owed to the first and remember that he was a Christian and that he was more obligated to his soul than to human interests. However, news now circulates that people were searching for Dorotea and that they accused the lad of having kidnapped her. So the two fugitives disappear into the densest region of the Sierra Morena. Dorotea then describes how the boy hesitated in his loyalty to her and wanted to take advantage of the opportunity that he believed these wastelands offered him. He began proposing sex and upon her rejection, he started to use force. According to Dorotea, she resisted his attack and heaven favored her. With my little strength and with hardly any effort, I pushed him over a cliff where I left him and I know not whether he is dead or alive. Since then, she has spent several months in the Sierra Morena and even found a shepherd whom she has served disguised as a boy. But her nightmare does not end there. Eventually, the shepherd found out that Dorotea was a woman and there was born in him the same wicked idea as in my servant. She had to flee again. Let's review. Another story of desire and betrayal with large doses of melodrama, action, mystery, and even violence. And again, everything is told in the absence of Don Quixote, who is supposedly doing his penance in the same mountains and not far from the same stream in which Dorotea washes her feet. Consider the dark realism of Dorotea's story, radically different, for example, from the pastoral tale of Grisostomo and that infinite number of rich youths, hidalgos, and peasants who take to the fields to lament Marcella's rejections, throwing their sighs to the wind and carving her name into the bark of giant beech trees. I have to admit that Dorotea's narrative subtleties have left me with more questions than answers, especially regarding the mental complexity of women that our Spanish writer appears to have captured. But I leave you with another question. Did our peasant girl kill the young man who attempted to rape her? Or another way, is there a decaying corpse at the bottom of a cliff somewhere in the Sierra Morena that remains to be discovered?